My name is Don Mears. I'm a documentary filmmaker. I'm on my way to interview UFO contactee Liam Freeney. Now, Liam appeared in the first Australian Skies film with claims of UFO sightings, black helicopters and government cover-ups. However, according to Liam, this is only the tip of the iceberg. As Liam reaches a crossroad with this phenomenon, we will ask the question, is it extraterrestrial contact or government conspiracy? Or is it something far more stranger? This is what we are chasing. This is Australian Skies 2, Contact of Interest. Going. My name's Don Mears, I'm the director of Dojo Media, and welcome to Australian Skies 2 Contact of Interest. I'm here in Kiama, which is a lovely coastal town about two hours south of Sydney in New South Wales, and I'm here to meet a UFO contactee by the name of Liam Freeney. Now, in the first film, there was always a reluctance to attribute what these objects were in the sky that people were filming, and rightly so. However, with Liam, he was always adamant that what was happening to him was otherworldly. And when I asked him why he was so certain of this, his response was, look, these objects in the sky are just the tip of the iceberg. It's what starts to happen to you after you film these things, that's what will convince you. So as a result, he's invited us to Kayama to have a bit of a chat about some of these strange things. Now to make the film, I've got the crew here. I've also got a good friend of mine and fellow filmmaker, Attila Cowdy. Attila's here not just because of his technical ability, but because he himself has also experienced some of these strange things that Liam's perhaps experienced. And I thought it might be interesting to get the two of them together to meet. So there you have it. What's the next step past these objects in the sky? What's the next thing? What's the next level with them? I suppose to find out those answers, we're going to have to find Liam, who apparently is down on the jetty somewhere. You catch anything? Uh, only with the camera, mate. <laughs> How, are you? How are you? Good to see you. Fantastic. My name's Liam Freeney. I'm 42 years old, married, two children, and I live in Kiama in New South Wales, Australia. I have a job, I work hard, full time. I'm from New Zealand. Uh, we moved to Australia in 2008, and we've been here ever since. So yeah, it's a lovely spot we have moved to. Obviously the reason why I'm sitting in this chair, something dramatic changed for me in uh, 2013. I basically saw a UFO and it sort of dramatically changed the way I look at life. Before that time I never gave this subject or these UFOs or anything like this any thought, it wasn't part of my life but since 2013 it's had quite a big impact on my life. The whole thing started 
March the 18th, 2013, but things started to change. Three months beforehand, I started getting a sort of a funny feeling that I should be looking at the sky. Uh, so I bought some binoculars, but they weren't just your normal binoculars. They were astronomy binoculars, of course, and they you almost needed someone else to sort of help you carry them. They were pretty big. And I, I started looking at the sky during the day through them and was looking, you know, on the edges of clouds. And I guess I by that stage I knew I was looking for something. And I think it was a UFO. I just was convinced I was going to see one. Uh, my wife thought it was pretty cool that I had a, another interest in life. She's like, oh, good on you. And uh, when I, she asked me what I was looking for, I was like... UFO, she goes, oh, that's great, dear. You know, no problem. Just a bit of a laugh. But, uh, yeah. Little did she know, and what was she going to find out shortly? No, what was she, what was she trying to do? Oh, she's trying to pop it. Like that. Oh, she's trying to pop it. Like that. Oh, I can do it. Can you? Um, I don't think that chicken's going to cook in time, babe. That's alright. So you might have to have one piece of fish. Yep. And then you might have to ah! on the way home. Yeah, yep. What are you doing? Just having a look at something. Hang on. Uh, the day happened. And it was March the 18th. So I found myself at about 1 o'clock, 1.30, sitting outside the office, having a coffee. Just sitting in a chair, just looking out at the sky, sort of southwest. And I spotted this sort of white, what I thought at first was a parachute, just sitting in the sky. And I was looking at it for a while. And then a plane flew in front of it, like a big commercial plane. And I realised that it wasn't a parachute, because this thing was a long way behind the plane, but yet it was probably twice as big as the plane. So I, then I was like, whoa, this is, this, is, this is what I've been waiting for, this is it. And it was, all I can describe it as, it was spitting out these bright lights. And they were sort of all floating around this big object. And then they came together in a diamond shape. But the moment they came together, they lit up. It was like, boosh, and lit up. And then they all dissipated away and drifted around this big object. And then something strange happened. A, a fighter jet went and intercepted this object. And that was the last I saw of it. And the, and the uh, plane that went to intercept it. This three. Yeah. Exactly, what the hell are they? Son of a gun, this is fat, absolute gold. Actually, there's more. There's more. Oh my God, we've got it. Well, then there's the curiosity part. I was waiting and waiting and waiting and I was convinced and then it happened. So now you want to know what it is. And that's... That was it. That was it for me. I was like, right, I need to find out what I've just seen. There. Two of them. Okay. Infrared on. Two objects. Occasionally lighting up. So I was ready for the next one because I was, yeah, I just, I was like, now I've seen it. I need more. I need to see more. I need to figure out what it was. So I'd go to work every day and I'd set it up just in the office so it was ready to go. And it took five or six weeks. So I was at home by myself. I think it was a Saturday. And I was just pottering around home when I had this sort of overwhelming urge to get in the car and drive up. It's only five minutes from home, but up on top of this hill and have a look. And within minutes of me getting up there, this huge craft appeared. Here we go. This is... 
pretty crazy. See it? There it is. Above that pole. There. Look at this. It's just sitting over Kaima. That's full zoom, unfortunately. I can't get any closer to it. Sheepers. Look at that. Come on, where are you? Where is it gone? Friggin' lost it. Come on, camera. Ah, uh, it's gone. It's gone. As for Liam, um, he was introduced to me through a mutual investigator who invited me to come along and investigate further exactly what it was that Liam was seeing in the sky. As for Liam's technical ability within modern day electronics, he doesn't know anything about cameras. He's got absolutely no clue about computers. He's not up to date with software, editing software or anything like that. He's in the building industry, he's nuts and bolts, he gets dirty, he gets dusty, that's what he likes to do and that's all he's ever done. He's a family man, you know, he's got a wife, he's got kids, he's got a job, he's got responsibilities, he really does. So here's a guy that doesn't need the attention, you know, it's, it's not like um, he's unemployed and he's got nothing better to do, this guy's got bills to pay. Having seen all this footage, it was extremely intriguing and that led us on the path of wanting to know what Liam was about. My mum lives in New Zealand, so I rang my mum to tell her. So I'm very close with my mum and I went, Mum, you're not going to believe this. I saw this and uh, it's just incredible. You know, and I'm going to go out and look for them. And she said, can you do something for me? She goes, don't go out at night by yourself. And I went, well, that's a bit strange. Shouldn't you say, well, that's a weird thing to see. But she said, don't go out at night by yourself looking for them. So I always thought that was strange. Yeah. And uh, since then, my mum and I have had lots of talks about them. And she's told me a few stories herself. From where we uh, grew up in New Zealand, that she said it was a bit of a hot spot, apparently. Um, a lot of people would see uh, strange crafts and lights in the sky. And she's since told me quite a few different stories of sightings that she's had. But each one started with, I think I, oh, we saw one once. I often thought about, after that, speaking with mum, I wonder if my dad had ever seen any, but unfortunately he'd passed away a year before this happened, so uh, I didn't get a chance to talk to him about his maybe involvement or if he'd ever seen any, so because he had a military background, he was in the British military, but like I said, I have no idea if he knew anything about it or saw anything, he never talked about it. He didn't talk about anything, to be fair, about what he did in the military at all. Pretty much not once. <laughs> so, 
that's as far as I, I know. I can't, I don't have anything. But Jeepers, I'd love to ask him. I would love to ask him. say 90% of the things I see uh, during the day. I don't very, I very rarely go out at night. I was at first at night, but things were happening for me during the day in a beautiful blue sky. And so basically it's, it's always been that way. When you're climbing, always have three points of contact on the, uh, on the surface. Alright, so just take it easy. Do your bollocks count as one point? <laughs> if they're hanging low enough. <laughs> On location with Don Mears. I grew up in a, a really small town in the middle of the South Island of New Zealand, called Arthur's Pass. And uh, yeah, it was, it was mountainous. Basically, obviously, there was a wee school there, but when you weren't at school, you were out on your own exploring. And your parents sort of just left you to it. And you'd just be at home for dinner, and that was from a very young age. So, my dad was a, a pretty big mountain climber. He uh, had this, this urge to uh, climb the highest mountains he could find, so he climbed them in New Zealand, and then he discovered the Himalayas. And so, yeah, he went climbing in the Himalayas and climbed several mountains over there. Mount Everest, Amber de Blam, just yeah, and this is back in the 80s. So yeah, he was just a, a tough mountain man, but obviously a great dad, of course. But he was a hardened mountaineer. Would you ever want your kids to be contactees? Oh, look, I guess you don't have any choice if it does happen, but um, I'd probably prefer it not to happen. <laughs> because there's just, there's so much more that goes along with it that, uh, yeah. If I am thinking about it and someone, like I said, if someone wants to know about it and they seem really genuinely interested, or I'm talking about it, it's, it does happen. Yeah. I 
I've got it on zoom right now. I've got a little bugger. I've got it on full zoom in the centre of my camera. It's fantastic. The feeling is a feeling where you don't have any choice in the matter. You have to get to an area and you don't think why you're going there, why you're going there, you just have to get there. You have to get to this point. People that I've met over the years, um, a lot of people that I've met who've actually been, or have had interest or still have interest in the UFO phenomena, have that draw to the whole subject. And they will go to some pretty extreme limits to try to capture the next close encounter on video. Wow, I've just got another one flew across it. There's a lot going on up here today, guys. Holy smokes. That euphoria that people have claimed to have experienced, I think that's what they're searching for, that euphoric moment. How you feel when you see it, because nothing comes close to it. Nobody will ever understand that unless they're going through it. But you've, you come across, you could be in the middle of nowhere and come across this and see it. The feeling that you get is just like overwhelming. And you are, you're, you're up there for days. Yeah, easily 20 minutes of the state stationary. Oh, I'm getting some awesome footage here. Oh, yeah. It's, you zoomed right up? Yep, it's, it's actually on, it's under the cloud, it's on our side of the cloud now, it's, it's getting closer. Because, yeah, I believe it's on our side of the clouds. He's moving left quite quickly though. I'm, I'm going to have to say there is a link between the object and, and myself because they've, it's got me to go to a certain point. Like I'm not just sitting at home, you know, I've left the environment that I was at to go somewhere completely different and then for this to show up. So clearly there's a link. Um, it's definitely drawing you to a spot where it wants you to, or clearly wants you to be there. And I find it strange to even say that, trust me, but it's, it's just reality. It's, it's quite interesting because the way an experience like that affects you is, is quite profound and you just want to know more, you just want to go after and more. You just want to put everything, your whole life to the side and just go on this absurd quest uh, to know more about the origins of these UFOs. Liam, you, um, you were saying that you'd never had any previous interest in ufology or, or any sort of this phenomena before your experiences. Once you started having these experiences though, did you ever go back and have a look through your uh, childhood history or anything like that and notice anything strange? If I think about it and look back on my childhood, I would say there's definitely some um, points in time in my life where possibly something was going on. Uh, one particular event sort of comes to mind where for about three years as a child, I think I was sort of seven to ten or six to nine, something like that, I used to suffer from these horrendous migraines and they were just the worst thing you could possibly ever wish on your worst enemy. They were so bad that I would just throw up all day. I couldn't eat, I couldn't drink, and I'd have to be in like a dark room. You know, like, you're just the worst migraine ever, but it was every Sunday morning for three years or so, I'd wake up with this. And the night before the migraines would start, I was convinced that there was something or someone, or maybe three of them, outside my window and I was convinced that they were coming in. 
when you were getting the migraines, did your parents ever take you to see a doctor for them or anything like that? Um, absolutely, because they were so, I was so ill and sick that my parents, and my mum especially, was like, you know, really concerned. Everyone was concerned, so yeah, I was having scans. Um, they did all the food tests, colour tests, you know, and they just couldn't figure out why I was getting them. They never, never found out. And they said, look, you know, you might grow out of them one day. Hopefully that's what will happen, and I guess I did. But um, it went on for three or so years, and it was, it got to the point where we didn't go away because we knew what was going to happen to me on that Sunday. Why I got involved into the UFO field, or the whole subject of UFOs, was that this is something that sort of goes back as far as childhood. Um, some of the experiences that I had when I was a kid, some of the ambiguous lights that I saw, um, I guess it just quested my thirst to know a little bit more. Okay, I woke up one morning and I'd had a dream that night that I'd been taken in a craft and I was flying over the water to look at this massive sphere and above it were ten small crafts. So each craft had taken one person mm. and I was just allowed to watch what was going on and this was my dream. See this is where the UFO field you know, gets a wee bit different, or not different, complicated. I started having dreams of flying and UFOs and or like walking across a paddock and finding a UFO and all of a sudden the door would kick open and there'd be two sort of humanoid looking people going, come on we've been waiting for you, let's go. And it's just, you wake up in the morning just going, what on earth, you know. Mm. Next morning, this is what I woke up to, mm. I do have that video. What the hell? <laughs> oh my god. Yeah. I felt like I had been beaten up with a softball mm. bat, like you wouldn't believe. So I'm taking photos in the morning, in the evening, serious bruising. Jesus, you didn't go to the hospital for that? Yep, I went to the doctor and and he sent me straight to the hospital, he goes, you've been bitten by a snake. Mm -hmm. I'm like, well, I live in a nice two-story house, I don't believe it got into the bed with me. So I was at Westmead Hospital, did toxicology reports, nothing. Now, I'm starting to get pretty confused by it. Because this is uh, this is really starting to mess with my head. As as excited as I was to start with, I was like, "Well, what's going on?" Okay. Right. Like, yeah, it was pretty full on. It drew pictures. It changed shape. It kept drawing all this crazy stuff. Jesus. And then the next week, this I get this one. Just these lines, these wicked bruises that's on, just on the back there. Yeah. I get, yeah, so much. So, that's a whole new twist to it. It's not just a matter of, oh, seeing UFOs, that's cool. There's another side to it, which isn't that cool. And I mean that because, hey, why do you go to bed feeling fine and wake up and you've got holes in your legs? Liam, you've just been showing us these photographs of these bruises on your body or alleged snake bites on your body. Is there any blood at all? No indication of bleeding. Nothing on sheets or pillows, like from a wound or anything like that? No, because it's, it's always, I'm in bed, yeah. I wake up with it, and that's how I wake up with these marks. So, you don't wake up when you get the bruise, you wake up the next morning and you have the bruises? I wake up in the morning and they're there. I wish that we could, while we've got you here and while we're together and filming this, I mean, it'd be awesome if we could set up cameras to try and capture this, but the problem is we don't know what's going to happen, and that's the really frustrating thing for me, is all this stuff sort of happens, and I can't catch it. Frustrating doesn't begin to explain how I feel about this. I'd love to know where it's coming from, but I don't know what to do. I'm at my wit's end. I'm dealing with it, I'm carrying on with my normal life, but I'm trying to just forget about it all, but I'm still waking up with it, it's still happening. Well, let me ask this, and don't be offended, mm -hmm. have you ever considered going to see someone like a professional? I have looked into it, 
and there's pretty much only one person that I would look at going to see. Who's that? Her name's Mary Rodwell, and she's a, a contactee therapist. And if I was to go to anyone, I would, yeah, I would probably go and see her. But she's miles away from where I live, you know. Okay, well, let me ask you this then. If we can find out about Mary, and if we could organise it, would you be interested in going down that path? I think that where I'm at, at the stage I'm at, I don't have any other options, and I would like to find out more, so if you could uh, organise it, and we could get in front of Mary Rodwell, uh, I'd be there. I would go. So what is it that we're seeing? What do you think that we're actually seeing? I think we are seeing a mixture of man-made as well as extraterrestrial. And more and more recently, there's more and more man-made. What are these UFOs, really? Look, I mean, personally, I, I really have no idea. You know, a lot of them are misidentified. A lot of them are obviously drones, you know, unmanned aerial vehicles. Um, is there a possibility that we are being visited by, you know, intelligence from another world in this universe of ours? As opposed to some form of, you know, experimental military vehicle. Some of the things that I've seen, I know that aren't from here because there's no way <laughs> that it's not just a disc-shaped UFO. It's a, it could be, and then it changes into three different forms, mm. and then it's gone over there into a pinprick, and then in two seconds later it's back in front of you. So you have to ask yourself if someone came to you as an outsider, someone who's not interested in this field, and they said that they saw something, which one would you accept? Would you accept the more incredible explanation being an extraterrestrial vehicle? Or would you accept the explanation that it's some form of new military technology? So, where our business was, this is all sitting in the same spot. They, I'd see them somewhere over there, and then they'd come back to the same spot where they would do their display. Mm. After a while, I figured out, well, I, I got the, I was pretty sure of it, that there's a factory <laughs> that they were interested in. One of the massive factories, I mean, giant, you know, big factories. I'm pretty certain that, that that had something to do with the interest. That's why they were there. There was something going on in this building. I found a building very close to where we worked. I mean, proximity to where all this is going on, I would say 10,000 square foot or bigger building and it was very high security also to get through that gate then through you know the the boom dates and there was security. So I went nosing down there for this ginormous building with no signage except a tiny wee sign yeah. just yeah. To, obviously for um, the DA and all what they needed and it had a very small plaque. Like it had an <laughs> emblem and, and wrote <laughs> something, something, something on that plaque. But this is where I've got to be careful. Yeah. Because I've been told to shut up. Yeah. Because I believe a lot of it's got to do with this. Is something going on in one of these buildings? Have I accidentally stumbled across, or am I accidentally filming? something I shouldn't be that possibly has been tested or something was being made in that building that was creating interest from above. Hey guys, how are you going? I've been getting a lot of thought to Liam's marks on the body and how a doctor said that was snake bites. Now, admittedly, Australia has a lot of snakes. So we're on our way to meet up with an old friend of mine, Richard, who appeared in the first Australian Skies film. Now, Richard's a farmer, so he's dealt with snakes on a fairly regular basis. And uh, when I rang him and I said, look, can I come out and ask you a couple of questions about snake bites? He said, look, I'm actually gonna be removing 
a snake from a shed this afternoon. Why don't you come over and watch, and then afterwards we can have a bit of a chat. Now, most Australian farmers will remove snakes themselves off their properties. They are experienced. They have grown up around snakes. They know which ones are venomous and which ones are non-venomous. They know which ones that they can remove safely themselves and when they should probably bring some up to come out and give them a hand to remove a snake. Having said that, if you're having a snake problem, always ring a professional and get them to come out to remove the snake. Do not attempt to do this yourself at home. If it was me, I would have 10 professionals come out to remove the snake. I would have the military or have a SWAT team come out because I really don't like snakes and I can't believe you're making me go out and do this, Joe. This is your fault. No, this is your fault. Sorry, can't help. Okay, you got him, you got him. Alright. So what kind of snake is it? Oh, he's just a calf of python. Now, is it venomous? No. No, these guys kill their prey by um, constricting. Let me ask you this, Rich. Have you ever been bitten by a snake before? Yeah, plenty of times. Now, next question. Did it hurt? Oh yeah, yeah it hurts. If this fellow crawled up in your bed, you'd feel it. Yeah. All right, let's put the fellow in the bag. All right. Joe, do you want me to cover this or do you want to open a bag? I'm not opening no bag, no way, no, no. <laughs> now, if you put him in there, don't let him go, because I'm letting the bag go right now, okay? Now, I'm letting it go. What are you going to do with him now, Rich? Um, so it's going to let him out into the wild. He's probably coming here looking for a quick feed. Uh, or he's followed, you know, he's followed a mouse or something in here and he's either eaten it or he's lost it um, and he just thought, well, while I'm in here I'll have a nap. Um, so we'll go let him back out in the bush and he can spend his night chasing some field mice. We come out of this bag and have one look at me and probably have one last little go. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's like you. Just they camouflage quite well, don't they? Yeah. A lot of people come down tracks, they don't even see them at night because they just literally look like the ground. Yeah, you know, it sticks in um, still. That's their best defense mechanism, eh? especially these things that aren't venomous. All they've really got is their camouflage. When you get bitten by a snake, is there ever any blood? Yes, yeah, there's blood, especially when you remove the, remove the snake from the bite. Um, you know, most venomous snakes do have a portion of the venom that's designed to stop the blood from clotting. You're definitely going to bleed. If a snake crawled up into your bed and bit you while you were sleeping, do you think you would wake up? You wouldn't sleep through it. <laughs> you wouldn't sleep through it? No, not, not, no, definitely not, uh, no. Good stuff, I'm happy with that. Ah, snake! <laughs> oh, I need a new camera bag because I'm going to kill this one. High five on that one. Oh, I got done. <laughs> Is that the blue real? See, that's, that's how you'd wake up being bitten by a snake. <laughs> you'd jump about three metres in the air. When you hear someone's story, often they're the most sceptical of all because Pardon still wants to believe it's not real. The reason I wrote Awakening was because I realised how many people out there f were actually having experiences, which was a surprise to start with. Initially I thought it was very rare. It became very clear to me that there was a lot more going on that the public didn't know about. But what worried me was there were people all over the country that were writing to me saying, who do I go to? And that was what Awakening was, was really written for, a resource book for experiences. You know, they may say, well, you're probably going to think I'm crazy. <laughs> you know, I saw this UFO and I didn't, I felt different afterwards and I'm not quite sure if something happened with time or whatever. You know, the first thing that I say to them is, look at the questionnaire that I'm going to send you. And that is the very first thing I do because 
they may not have been aware that this may have well been happening all their life and the seeing the UFO is the final part of their waking up. There's a lot of misconceptions about regression. We've all got a knowing inside us, you know, resonance to truth. Even if we can't prove it, we have that kind of resonance when we hear stuff. Um, it may be, you know, random. You know, you hear something and you think, mm, that fits for me, that, that makes sense, even though it can't necessarily be proved. What I do when someone's in that space, one of the, the thing, two things they want to know is, was it real? Did I have this experience? Secondly, why? Why me? What's it all about? Well, when you take them into that space, one of the things some researchers won't do is ask those questions. They'll get them to show the scenario. They'll, yes, you're on a craft, you're lying on a, a bed, they're doing things to you, but they won't take it to that next level, which is actually asking questions. Because what I've discovered is when they're in that space, you can ask those questions and they can have a dialogue. Do you reckon you can still keep the camera rolling if the security guard asks? Oh, hell yeah, we'll just... Yeah, right. don't, don't stop recording, Michelle. Just while we get it over each and over. Yeah, put the camera down. Okay, sorry guys, we're going ghost vision in here. We've come out to have a bit of a look at this area that Liam is talking about. This could just be one big coincidence. And that's what we're here to try and find out, is... Does this plaque exist? Does this company exist here? And is there something strange going on? Okay, apparently this is it, mate. This is right in front of us. How come we didn't see it? I don't know. What Liam said is right, that there is an organisation here fitting the name that he's given out and with a bit of research on it, yeah, they seem to fit the bill. If you were a conspiracy theory person, your red flags would be flying thick and fast. Does it prove anything? No, it doesn't. I still believe in coincidence, but it's very interesting. Right, let's go back in. Yeah, I definitely think that... Look, I think it's worth investigating, but I don't know. I think it still could be a big coincidence. It's hard to say, to be honest. It really is. Um, how far do you want to go with this? Well, that's a really good question because all the conspiracy stuff terrifies Liam. He doesn't want anything to do with it, doesn't want his family involved, and he's asked me to be keep it all out, like be very careful of it. I have another idea, though. I need your opinion on this. Mm. I think that we should not pursue this at this point for this film that we're making now of Liam. But I, I do have another idea of where possibly we could go. Last night, Liam were in the kitchen and we were talking and I asked him if he'd ever considered going to see a therapist or a mm. professional to talk about his experiences. Surprisingly, he said he had and that uh, the only person that he would actually go talk to was a therapist by the name of Mary Rodwell, mm. who apparently specialises in contactees. Well, I know Mary. Oh, okay. Um, I've known Mary for quite some time, and she's dealt with countless cases, very similar to what Liam is going through. He's at his wit's end with this whole UFO thing. He definitely would like to get some answers or at least be able to move on. What I'd like for him is to be able to walk away from this film with at least a little bit of peace, if you could get that. Send him back to his family with a bit of peace. Do you think there's a shot that might work if we go see Mary Rodwell? I think so. Um, look, he could be chasing UFOs for 10 years and not get anywhere with it. But at least with Mary, he could get some peace. But at the same token, um, he needs to understand that if he does access memories that have been suppressed for some reason, that can change him. It's almost like Pandora's box. Once you open it, you can't go back. Yeah, right. But Mary's up in Queensland. That's the other thing. Yes. Which means we might be going on a road trip. Mm.
gehen. guys, how are you going? I'm on my way to Bundaberg Airport in Queensland to pick up Liam and then we're going to go visit Mary Rodwell. Now we managed to get in contact with Mary and she agreed to talk to Liam on Skype and uh, that talk lasted for a couple of hours where they went into a lot of his experiences and the conclusion was that perhaps a regression might be the best way to proceed uh, somehow look at some of his memories to do with these experiences in the hope of finding an answer for him. So that's what we're going to do next. Now Mary started as a registered nurse and then she became a counsellor and a therapist and opened up her own practice and it was there that she came across a contactee. Now since then she's worked with over 3,000 contactees and also set up her own organisation here in Australia called CERN and is also a founding member and on the board of directors of the astronaut Dr. Edgar Mitchell's Foundation of Research into Extraterrestrial Encounters called FREE. So if anyone can help us find an answer to what's going on with Liam, I'm hoping Mary's the one. Hey! Good mate. How you going? Good, how are you? Good, how's your flight? Awesome, buddy. Excellent. Good, good, to, good to be here, mate. Good to see you. Fantastic. You ready? Ready as I'll ever be. Ready let's, do ever. This. let's do it. Let's do it. Yeah, and just relax. Yeah. Yeah. And whatever. That one is. Um, I've taken some notes. The most important thing here yeah. is that we're going to shut down left brain and we're going to allow right brain full, full, the full panorama of whatever comes in. Yeah. And it's easy, actually it's quite easy, but it's hard in another way. It's easy because you don't have to think. Mm -hmm. It's hard because you've got to shut down left brain to do it. Trance states, we're going into them all the time. Watching television, getting really focused okay. on something is when you go into a trance state. Sometimes when you're driving even. <clears throat> if you're going on a, a journey and you're doing a long journey, yeah. you sometimes forget where you are because you, you've gone into a you've kind of trance. You've driven through a small town. That's right. Yeah. It's, so we're doing it all the time. So there's nothing magical about it mm -hmm. at all. The important thing with this is that what we're, what we're doing really is shutting down left brain so the right brain the one that takes in all the information, all the experiences that you've had on multiple levels. It doesn't edit, mm -hmm. it just spits them out. Okay. So for that, what I'm going to say to you is when I take you into that space, what I'm asking is to talk to the subconscious. The subconscious, I call it the superconscious as well. Yeah. And when I say, you know, um, what are you seeing or what are you experiencing or whatever, whatever comes, I need you to say it. No matter okay. how weird, wonderful or or strange it may appear to your left brain, yeah. your right brain is experiencing this. So what we're really doing is accessing your subconscious, your superconscious, and, and that part of you, that intuition, that, in, that part of you that knows. Mm -hmm. We're bringing it all together in this, this experience. So there'll be your knowing, your sensing, all those things will be valuable as part of the information. Yeah. You know, so that's how, how it works. And I'm with you. Yeah. I'm okay. actually in that space too. Good as part of it because that's my role as, as part of it as well so you will not be alone through any of this mm -hmm. 
Okay. Gotcha. So have you got any questions? Not really. I'm too, okay, just, just ready to go. And, uh, I'm just all well, new and let's just, let's just let's do this. Let's just go with the adventure. Yeah, it's an just, adventure. That's an adventure and we will just see what unfolds. <sighs> yep. However it unfolds. And we'll get some answers. Cool. That's okay. what we want. That's see, what you put a little, as well. a little something over your eyes if necessary. Yeah. And yeah. you didn't need to worry about the blanket. I always have a blanket. Yep. Yeah. Now, I was just saying if, if um, I have got something I can put over the eyes. It's my favourite colour too. Oh, is it? <laughs> oh. Just start taking some nice deep breaths. Yeah. Just relax your breath. Calm. Relax your breath. 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 Relax and as you walk down the steps, you're going to go deeper and deeper into this awareness and this knowing. As I count you down from 10, 9, 8, deeper and deeper. 7, 6, 5, deeper and deeper. 4, 3, 2, 1. You're now standing at the bottom of the steps. And right in front of you is a beautiful, brightly lit passageway. And I want you to notice that on your left are many doorways, starting from your present age and going backwards in time. And we're going to a particular experience that happened when you were only seven years old. So I want you to find the doorway that says seven on it. And I want you to tell me when you see it and what it looks like. Yeah, it's a green door. Thank you. What's the next thing that happened? gone dark. Okay, what kind of clothing have you got on? Got short pyjamas, like oh. summer pyjamas. Okay, summer pyjamas. And you're standing where? In, 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 in the bedroom. In the bedroom. Okay, where is the window? On my left. Okay, where is the door? There's one behind me and one in front of me. Okay. And I want you now, you were talking about being aware that you felt something was through the window. What are you feeling now when you look towards the window? There's a bright light there. Okay. So you're seeing a bright light. What do you feel? I just see this bright light. Okay. I just see this super bright ball of light. It's a ball of light? Yeah. Whereabouts is that ball of light? At my head, right at my head height. At your head height. Okay. What's the next thing you're aware of after you see this ball of light? What's the next thing that you feel or sense? There's other, there's other things here. What are the other things that you're sensing? Just beings, three, three beings in there. Can you describe what they look like? They've got big heads. Okay. Have they got any clothing? No, they're just all grey. Okay. Can you sense their height? Same height as me. Okay. What's your feeling from them? Well, I'm terrified. And they're leading me out. They're taking me out of here. How do they take you out of your room? Just through the glass. What's the next thing you're aware of? So it's, it's a big, big room. It's bright. So you're in a big room. Mm. It's okay. really bright. Okay. So it's very bright? It's hot as well. It's really hot. Okay. What can you see? What are you, what are you aware of in the room? I can't see anything. It's just this big, it's just bright, it's hot. And I'm lying down. What are you lying on? A bench, table. It's, it's quite comfortable, but it's thin. Okay. And you're, you're lying down? I'm lying down. A, a tall sort of human, tall human person comes in. Looks human. Okay. Can can you describe what the colour of the hair is? It's long blonde hair. Long blonde hair. Is it male or female? Male. Okay. What clothing have they on? It's like a green, green suit. 
a green suit. Mm. Have you seen anything like that before? Not in green. Not in green? No. Okay. What are you feeling and what are you sensing? I'm just scared. He's just holding my head. He's just got both his hands on my head. I just see lots of colours. I'm seeing lots of different colours. Is that while his hands are on your head? Yeah. Giving me information of some sort. Okay, do you understand that? No. So what's the, the next thing then that you remember? I'm just waking up sick. Okay, and so you wake up feeling sick? Yeah, I'm back in my bed. Okay. I want you to sense and feel now this location that you were taken to. Where did you sense that location was or where do you feel that location was? I was in a ship. And these beings that um, interacted with you, do you get any sense of who they are? Friends. You felt they were friends? Yeah. Okay. Okay, well, we can ask some more questions about that in a minute because I'd like to take you to the next experience that you want to understand. And so I want you to leave that particular um, space and that particular age and I want you to go to the time when you were working and um, at Wetherill Park in West Sydney. It's a bright light in the sky. How far away is it? It's a long way away. Okay. It's small. And it's small? but I just see it. Okay. Can you describe what's actually happening as you're watching it? Is it... Is it's getting it... closer. Okay. Where are you? Standing outside the office. More lights. There's lots of them now. Okay. Mm. When yeah, you there's see... lots of them. Lots That's, of them? Yeah, maybe 15. Okay. And the big one. And the big one. So they're still staying around the craft, are they? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So you're aware of more lights. What happens next? They, they all sort of made a big pattern in the sky, like a diamond. So the, all the small ones have made a big diamond-shaped pattern in the sky next to the big object. Okay. The pattern's just changing. Mm. It's made a big, it's made like an L shape in the sky, but it's backwards. Does that mean anything to you? No. Okay. Two fighter jets show up. There's two fighter jets. Okay. So can you identify them in any way? Is there any identifying marks? They're silent. You don't, you don't hear them. They're just, they're just there. There's, okay. no, there's no noise to them. Okay. Maybe they're not fighter jets. Okay. So what do you sense they might be? I think they're probably the lights that came out of the big ship. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. Because they don't make any noise. Okay. Okay. So they're, they're, that's what you're sensing now, that they might be lights from there. Do any of them come anywhere near you or close to you in any way? The green and brown one was pretty close. By close, you mean what? 400 metres away. Okay, okay, that's the closest, is it, that yeah. it comes? And that's why it's strange, because I can't hear it. Okay, but you can see it? Yeah. Can you sense um, what, what, what is going on with this particular one, why it's come so close? guess it's coming to uh, have a look at what we're doing, maybe. Is that what you sense? Yeah. Okay. Because it comes down and does a big turn above us. Right above you? Yeah. Okay. Well, still a wee way away, but it comes down and turns right above our work, above the yard. Okay. okay. But it's just not making any noise. I'm just still trying to figure out why, why it's not making any noise. Okay, we'll ask that question. Have a sense of, of the, the craft and ask 
ask um, why perhaps it's not making any noise. What do you get when you ask that question? The start of a new journey for you. Have you got any other question that you'd like to ask? Okay. Do you know or sense who they are that are interacting with you? No. No, okay. So you're not, at the moment you don't know who they are that gave you that demonstration? No. Okay. Do you sense anything else may have occurred during that time? No. That's great. That's great. Okay. We're going now to find out a little bit more about the marks on the body. So I want you to move out of that particular doorway, go into the passageway again, and one of the, I want you to go to one that will give you the answers to the bruising and the other marks on the body. And as you're going into this, we're asking the question about marks on the body so I want you to tell me what's the first thing that comes to mind as we're asking about having these bruises and marks on your body what's the first thing you become aware of who are they and when you say that who do you mean what are you seeing just a big red light a red light a big, big red light okay Burning. Yeah, it's hot. Red light's really hot. Okay. So your your feet. It's sort of, it's like it's scanning me. Okay. So how is it scanning you? Whereabouts is it located to scan you? It sort of started with my feet, and it's just going right up my body. Okay. So where do the bruises come from? The red light. They leave them. What's your feeling about the red light? I'm scared. You're scared? Yeah. Okay. Okay. It's like it's alive. It's, that's, that's it. That's the being. Okay. So that's the being. And this being is the red light in, in a way? Yeah. Okay. It's alive. Okay. And this, uh, and what is your feeling um, knowing that it's scanning you? Is it, You said that you were fearful. Mm -hmm. Is it fearful because you didn't know what they were doing? Yeah, I don't know and I've got... No control, no control. Okay. And no control, okay. So you don't know why, you, you didn't know you've got any control, so the fear is that rather than anything else? Yeah, but I just don't know why it's doing it. Okay. It's not telling me. It's not telling you. So we need to get some answers about that. We can do that in a minute. Um, that's fine for that particular experience, we'll see in a minute. The other um, one we want to know is also we want to get answers now. We want to know why you, why you're, you're having these experiences and also we want to know um, some other things as well. One of them is about someone else that you have seen in a dream that you would like to know about. Um, so I want you now to go to one of the doorways that will help you understand the dream or the dreams that you have with a particular um, being or... Just walking through the park. You're walking through the park. What's the next thing you're aware of in, um, as we're looking into this, this being that you want to understand? And she's standing right next to me. Okay, are you conscious? Mm. Okay, you're seeing her? Yeah, she's standing right next to me. Has she a name? Mm-hmm. Aya, Aya. Okay. And as you're standing, look at, at her. What's the next thing you become aware of when you're with her? I think I've known her for a long time. Maybe another time. Previous life, previous okay. time. Okay. So you feel you've known her in another life? Yeah. And where was that life? Underground. Underground? Yeah. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? All the homes are underground. Okay. So why has she come to visit you in this life? 
what's the purpose of her being with you or visiting you? Make sure I'm okay. Okay. So she comes to make sure you're okay? Yeah. Okay. Is there any uh, anything you would like to know about her that you um, would like to ask? Where, whereabouts, whereabouts is she from? What's, where is it? Okay. And what does she say to you as you ask her that question? It's a long way away in the future. A long way away. So she's visiting you from the future? Mm. Okay. So why is she visiting you from the future? What is the purpose of her visits? To make sure I'm okay. To make sure I stay alive. So she's acting as a protection mm. for you? Yeah. Okay. And when you, she says that she's from the future, are we talking about a future in this particular solar system or some other dimension? That's here. Are we saying Earth? Mm. So it's a future of Earth mm -hmm. and she's visiting you from the future to protect you. Yeah. So why is it so important to protect you? What is it that is about you that needs protecting? Family. The whole family. The whole the family? Future. Okay. So it's about you and who else in the family? My children. Right. Your children? Mm. Any anyone else? No why. So what did, what is what is it that you need to be cautious of or careful of then in this particular time? People trying to stop. People trying to stop people. And when you say stop people, what do you mean by that? from leaving. Can you explain what you mean by that? Not really. Okay, but you understand? Sort of. Okay. So I would like to just ask one more question. First of all, I would like to ask if there's anything about your children or your wife or your parents that is significant for you to be aware of at this moment in time. to see my mum. I need to talk to her. Okay. I need to talk to her. You need to talk to mum. It's time, it's time to talk to mum. Okay. Okay. Is there anything? She's got answers. Okay. She can help me. So she's got answers and she can help. Mm. Okay. And is there anything else that you feel you need to understand? She's going to help. Is going to help. Mm. Okay. I want you now to be aware that you can move towards the steps, those golden steps, and I'm going to take you up those steps one at a time as I go one, two, three, becoming more aware, four, five, six, becoming more aware, seven, eight, nine, ten, bringing yourself through now the doorway that you created and bringing your consciousness and awareness back into your physical body, becoming aware of the comfort and relaxation of your body as you're lying here comfortably and feeling relaxed and refreshed. Hello. Very, very well for oh, your first you. time. You did extremely well. I feel like I've well. um, been drinking for about a week and I've got the dry horrors. <laughs> did extremely well for a first time. You will find if you do any others from this time, there will be actually a lot more. There will be easier and more spontaneous even than today. Mm. The first time is always difficult to move from left brain to right brain. It's opened a lot of doors. Yes. I remember what we've just discussed. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. They weren't fighter jets. No. They weren't fighter jets. No. <laughs> it's pretty cool. <laughs> they weren't bright lights. They came very close. Wow. 
Hmm. Should we do another one this afternoon? <laughs> <laughs> He's a glutton for punishment, really, isn't he? You know? Wow, that's very yeah. interesting. Yeah. But there's so much, there is obviously a lot, lot more that needs to be looked at. And some of it will come in now as we've actually opened the door. Yeah. You know, you'll suddenly get these insights. I think the interesting one is your visitor from the future. Hmm. That gave me a, a huge. Uh, <laughs> so it's not from the past; it's the future. No. Yeah, that was a. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's mind-boggling. <laughs> Thank you. You're most welcome. Yeah. How do you feel coming out, mate? Oh, I've been hit with a brick. I'm just like, feel a wee bit sort of, oof. No, I feel very, feel very vulnerable. Vulnerable. I I'm feel just, very vulnerable. Yeah. I'm like sort of sitting here all closed yeah. up, just going, yeah. ooh. Yeah. Just, we'll just sit for yeah. a bit longer, I think. Yeah. <laughs> yes, and you need to. Yeah. I'm going to make you a nice cup of tea in a minute. I'd love a cup of tea. Because that's what you need. So what is the something that we're waiting for? What is it that you're being prepared for? Because I see you still processing at the moment. Yeah, yeah. Very much so. Um, there's going to be there's going to be what I call light bulb moments mm -hmm. that he's going to get now. Yeah. And so it would be good for you to do another little thing with him. Yeah. In a few hours' time, maybe when he's rested, and say, now where are you at with it? And yeah. just say, is there any other things that that have happened in that regression that you now see in a different light or whatever because that's what's going to happen now. He's going to be assimilating yeah. and he's going to start getting more insights around mm -hmm. how he's putting it together. So I would suggest that you do something like that, but also in terms of his heightened abilities because that's, that's what some of this is about, is enhancing their intuitive abilities. See, I didn't even think about the cameras. Didn't you? No. I, I think you did didn't well even, then. Didn't even know that, I just One. didn't even know they were there. I was just more interested to uh, learn about what was going to happen. Thank oh, you so much. Oh, you're most welcome. You just take care of yourself. I will. Okay. I will. Thank you. And you know what I I do. So we're getting deep here, are we? Yeah, this is the wrap up. This is the wrap up. Mate. Cheers. Enjoy your beer. I think you have to. earned <laughs> earned beer. First off, I have to say, um, this is gonna sound pretty weird, but I'm very proud of you. I thought what you did today was I know it's terrifying for you. And I saw I didn't really uh, become apparent to me how scary it was until I saw you coming out of it all. I could see that look on your face. I know you well enough now to know that, wow, that was pretty serious for you. How did it go for you? Did it help is the question I really want to know. I think, I won't say a great weight's been lifted off my shoulders, but half of the weight has. I, I feel as though Mary answered or helped me answer some pretty serious questions that I gave to her because I'd given up. I just, I tried to get rid of it. I tried to stop thinking about it. But you can't give up on waking up with marks. Exactly. And, You've got to get some answers. So that's what we did up here. And clearly there's more to be, you know, I think it's going to be ongoing, but I, I really couldn't be happier right now with the, the way today went, mate. I know what I've got to do next. What are you going to do next? I think I've got to go, to, go and see my mum in New Zealand and talk to her. Wow. I think it's, I think I've got to talk to mum about a few things. Yeah. But I feel good. I feel like I've got some definite answers to some puzzling things that have gone on with me over the last five years. Or even further back. But no, I feel good, mate. And I've got to thank you for it because nice. you've helped me. Pretty much without you, I wouldn't have done this. Keep the book open. <laughs> <laughs> Watch this space. Yeah. Cheers. Cheers.
Alright guys, we're at the end of the film. Uh, even though Liam's about to head to New Zealand to talk to his mother, I don't think we should proceed any further. I think that this is a the next step of this journey is something that Liam is going to have to do on his own because I'm starting to realise with this side of the phenomenon that it's very personal and that it's uh, it definitely has two sides of the coin. On one side, we have people filming these objects and putting them on YouTube for the whole world to see and sharing them. But on the other side, it's very private and terrifying. Not just because of what people are experiencing, but also because people are afraid of being ridiculed and being ostracized. Because let's face it, if you're on the outside of this looking in, it's very easy to think that, wow, this just defies logic. The irony there, though, is that someone like Liam, who's experiencing this, would completely agree with you. So, I think the next time you think it'd be good to film a UFO, be careful what you wish for, because you might get more than what you bargained for. I need to thank the cast and crew, in particular, Attila, Mary, and, of course, Liam and his family. Without those guys, this film wouldn't have been made. So, thank you for watching, and who knows, perhaps we'll meet again beneath the Australian skies. There are people out there that are, I believe, that are having genuine experiences and are having trouble coping with them. Um, and I do believe that there are some people out there that feel so alone that they can't reach out to anyone because nobody will understand and listen to them. And it would be nice to reach out to these people, but it's very difficult. From all the evidence so far, all that we've gathered, all the data, not only in my own organisation of CERN, but also in FREE, is that what we're seeing is a huge shift in human consciousness. A, a shift that's showing us that we're not just 3D. And one of the reasons I love experiences talking about their story is when you see them, when you meet them, when you get to know them, you know that this is coming from a very real experience and how it's changed their life. That doesn't come from a fantasy. It doesn't come from a hallucination. It is there in their faces, in the emotion, and also maybe even in the trauma that they experience or are expressing to you when you help them. So I hope for them they will get validation, and I hope so in my lifetime, or I'm, I tell you what, I'm going to be really pissed off. So there's this whole underlying hidden side behind this UFO concept. What I've said is about 1% of some of the stuff that goes on. Uh, generally you uh, all have normal jobs and you get, get up and front up to that job and, and go and do your best and uh, keep all this to yourself. You just can't talk about it. Eyes ahead. If someone listening or watching this can relate to any part of what I've said, I would say that's going to be a success. Don't turn around. Yeah and to find someone trustworthy to talk about it if they haven't told, talked to anyone yet. Yeah, that would be uh, ideal. Because it's not easy. Eyes ahead.